Hello, welcome back to 40 Days of the Fathers. We are on day 15, still with Justin Martyr in his first apology, looking at chapters 36 to 47 of his text. So following on from yesterday's theme of prophecy, which predicts Christ, Justin explains the different types or modes of prophetic messages. From utterances which foretell the future through speaking on behalf of the Father, he goes on to say how the Jews missed the prophecies that pointed to Jesus, even those which showed that he would be crucified. And so the Jews hate the Christians who would keep showing these things from Scripture. What follows is some really interesting interpretation of prophecy in the Old Testament, which not only is used to prove the power of God, but also to show that the different ways prophecies are spoken demonstrates who inspired them, i.e. some are from the Father, some Christ, and others the Spirit. This is in itself demonstrating a view of the Trinity within prophecy too. So the Father. Quoting various passages from Isaiah, Justin makes the point that when a prophecy is spoken from a thus saith the Lord perspective, then that is the Father speaking through the prophet. For example, in Isaiah 66, verse 1, thus saith the Lord, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you would build for me? What is my resting place? The Son. For those times where the prophet speaks a message of suffering, pain or sacrifice from the perspective of God, then it is Christ speaking as the pre-existing word. He gives various examples from the Psalms and Isaiah to show this, such as Isaiah 50 verse 6. I gave my back to those who struck me, and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I did not hide my face from insult and spitting. And also in Psalm 22 verse 17 and 18. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among themselves, for my clothing they cast lots. The Spirit. When it is the Spirit speaking, it appears to be prophecies which are more in the third person about the Lord and what he will do. Using the example from Isaiah again, Justin gives an example of a prophecy which also goes on to explain how it has been fulfilled through Christ in the Christians who follow him. <clears throat> Isaiah 2, verses 3 to 4. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. I know many people today read this passage as something future and yet to be fulfilled, thinking it is speaking of a global event where all people suddenly stop making war. But Justin gives us an example of how early Christians interpreted this, and it's one I've never heard any modern preacher say or teach, and still I've never yet heard it since writing this book. And to quote Justin, and that it, the Isaiah 2, chapter did so come to pass we can convince you for from jerusalem there went out into the world men 12 in number and these illiterate of no ability in speaking but by the power of god they proclaimed to every race of men that they were sent by christ to teach all the word of god and we who formerly used to murder one another do not only now refrain from making war upon our enemies but also that we may not lie lie or deceive our examiners so he's he's explaining how this was fulfilled in that jerusalem was the central starting point from there the apostles went out they taught they preached and people who become christians are the ones who you know make peace now they they don't go to war anymore they beat their weapons into farming equipment so they can do better things than kill each other. You know, let nation won't lift up sword against nation because all nations come to Jesus. Um, people of different races and cultures come to Christ and are one in unity of faith. So in that sense, the uh, nation is no longer war against one another. Not necessarily a global event where everybody suddenly just drops their weapons. So I thought it was a very interesting view of that verse. 
Um, yeah, don't, it's something to think about. Christ's appearance and death foretold. Continuing with the theme of prophetic messages, Justin goes on to show more examples from the Old Testament which foretold the life of Jesus and the conspiracy which was formed against Christ by Herod, the king of the Jews and the Jews themselves, because he thought it right and relevant to mention some of the prophetic utterances of David. It goes on to quote the whole of Psalm 2 as his proof. I've not put it here, but there's a small bit. Yet have been set by him a king on Zion, his holy hill, declaring the decree of the Lord. The Lord said to me, Thou art my son, this day I have begotten thee. And to the death and resurrection of Jesus, he goes on to show that through the same David, intimated that Christ, after he had been crucified, should reign. He quotes 1 Chronicles 16, uh, verses 23 to 27, and merges that with Psalm 96 to make up one long prophetic statement. That's the habit of Justin throughout his writings. He likes to combine different parts of the Old Testament into one one sentence. So it makes it quite hard to figure out where he's pulling it from. So there's an interesting bit here which Justin quotes Psalm 96 verse 10 as saying, Let them rejoice among the nations. The Lord has reigned from the tree. He uses this here as proof that for Jesus reigning after his death. But if you look this up in the Bible now, it will say something slightly different, and not just because of the different translations. Modern Bibles will typically say, Say among the nations, the Lord is king. The world is firmly established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. So, um, quite different from what Justin wrote that verse as saying. And looking a little more into this, it appears that the quote in First Apology is the only ancient Greek text to have this wording. Any other quote of Psalm 96 verse 10 from Tertullian onwards, that's around 200 AD, comes purely from the translation in the Old Latin version, some also known as the Vetus Latina Bible, that was widely used by Christian communities from the second century onwards. So that version of the psalm, which is the Latin Bible, that predated the Vulgate Bible. And uh, the Vulgate was commissioned by Pope de Maistre the I. He commissioned Jerome to work on the Vulgate in 382 AD as a revision of the old Latin Bible. So whatever Justin's reading from is the only one that actually words it like this, which is it's kind of strange and interesting all at the same time. Um, prophecy and free will. The rest of the chapters go through more examples of prophetic messages and the different types that can be found in the Old Testament, such as explaining that sometimes the Spirit spoke prophecies in the past tense, as though they'd already happened. To avoid this being used as a reason to misrepresent the message, Justin goes on to explain that the things which God absolutely knows will take place, he predicts as if it had already taken place. So, an interesting way of how things were interpreted as well. There seemed to be some who would accuse the Christians of believing in fate, and so Justin offers an argument against such thoughts to provide some kind of prophetic responsibility, as he calls it. All of our actions, whether good or bad, whether they be rewards or chastisements, all of these are given due to man's own actions. Since if it, as he says, since if it be not so, but all things happen by fate, neither is anything at all by our own power. Which begins the argument for freedom of will, asserting that if people are fated to do either good or bad, then the one is no more deserving of reward than the other of punishment. Just a little quote here. From the text and again unless the human race have any have the power of avoiding evil and choosing good by free choice they are not accountable for their actions which personally i agree with i mean how can you be held responsible for what you've done if you didn't actually have the choice to do it in the first place so he goes on to make the argument that if fate decides how people act then it is fate which is the cause of evil and not people and, and if this is not how God has made mankind to be. To borrow from the terminology of fate, Justin 
makes one final point that there is there is one thing in which Christians assert is inevitable fate, that those who choose good will be rewarded. Those who choose evil will be punished. By this, prophecy is not nullified by free will, and free will is not overcome by prophecy. To that, all which God spoke through his prophets concerning rewards or punishments for the actions of the human race are still a valid foretelling even with freedom of will. Because God spoke thus to the man first created, Behold, before thy face are good and evil, choose the good. The choice is there, and the foretelling is that of the outcome of our choices. A couple more topics are covered briefly, such as those who lived before Christ, and how salvation affects them. And basically, it does, because Jesus was the pre-existing word. And Christ ruling from heaven, and the prediction of Judea being made desolate, fulfilling Isaiah 64, verse 10, which says, Your holy cities have become a wilderness. Though this has been quite a long chapter, and not as brief as I would maybe like to have kept it, there was a lot of topics to be covered, and I thought it would be, I thought it'd be an injustice to skip on these things, as they are central to some of our understanding of Christ and his relation to being the prophetic fulfilment of scriptures. I recommend you read the original text for today's chapters to really get an understanding of what Justin was saying and attempting to draw out in order to clarify Christian doctrine properly. Um, yeah, it does go into a lot, especially the the stuff about free will and prophecy. Yeah. Very interesting as well. And well, take a few readings maybe to get your head around how the two work together without contradicting one another. Um, even just reading these chapters to get an understanding of how you understand the Old Testament as prophetic of Jesus' coming and incarnation and all the other things. It's just very helpful as well. So, a bit longer, but I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, come back tomorrow for the next part of Justin Martyr's text. And uh, like the video, share it, thumb it up, subscribe to me support me on Patreon if you want, buy the book, it's on Amazon and elsewhere. Bye.